Hello viewers and welcome back to another episode of The Model Guy. And in this episode I'm going to be reviewing Arma Hobby's Hurricane Mark II in 48 scale. And let me tell you right out of the gates, it is a beautiful kit. On the sprues you can see a lot of detail, all the panel lines are nice and crisp, and the rivet detail is very, very fine. And it has the raised rivets as well in all the correct spots. Now in order to do a proper review of a kit, you do have to build it because some kits look really nice in the box and then turn out to be complete gong shows when it's time to build them. Arma is a relatively new company on the hobby scene with their focus mostly being in 172 models. You may recognize their brand from their famous Kai 84 release in 172, their Hurricane, their Wildcat, their P51 and even their P39 Air Cobra. They even had a 172 scale Hurricane which had better detail in that scale than some brands do in their 148 scale kits. Not to point any fingers, but I think we know who I'm talking about. The cockpit of Armas Hurricane is flush with details and just out of the box you have a very impressive office. Now I also chose to add some wires that were missing and that only took a few minutes to do. And the great thing about a model kit that's going together really well with zero stress is it leaves you a lot of energy to be creative and add more detail. Using a few different sizes of lead wire and copper wire and some good references on the Hurricane, I was able to make the office look even busier. Once all the wiring had had a full 24 hours to dry overnight, I then came in with some debonder to clean up all the excess glue and to have things look nice and tidy. Just make sure that when you use debonder, you've tested it on the styrene of the kit because some styrenes don't react very well to debonder and can result in quite a mess. One other quick tip as well, before you put the fuselage halves together, make sure you install the part that shows a closed handhold on the side of the fuselage. Once you put them together, you can't really get that part in. With a couple extra wires in place, it was then time to put down some primer to get ready for paint. When it comes to putting down a base for paint chipping, I like using Mr. Color 8 Silver. It's a lacquer paint and it's very durable and can handle a lot of abuse. And because it's a lacquer paint, I'll put acrylic paint on top of it, which means I get to skip the step of a chipping fluid. Then you just use a toothpick or an airbrush needle and you can bang up the paint as much as you want. When it comes to weathering aircraft models, one of the biggest tips I can give you is to have some good references on hand to work from. Use these references as a guide so you know what weathering is plausible and it keeps it looking realistic. One thing that really surprised me about Armas Hurricane is the detail they put into the gear bay. A lot of companies would cut corners here as it's not really visible, but Arma put just as much effort in here as they did on the wings. You can see all the hydraulic rams, all the locking mechanisms, and you can even see the accumulator as well. And it's got some very nice detail of the tie down straps that hold it in place against the bulkhead. To find out why the Hawker Hurricane was such an iconic aircraft in World War II, we have to go back to the mid-1930s where the RAF was still focused on biplane fighters. With no interest from the Air Ministry, Hawker moved ahead and took their Fury aircraft, knocked the upper wing off it, added retractable landing gear, and added eight machine guns. Coupled with the Merlin engine, Hawker had a winning aircraft. The Hurricane quickly went into production and became the backbone of the Royal Air Force. Due to its simple yet rugged design, the Hawker Hurricane could have battle damage repaired at the squadron level, meaning the aircraft would be back in service faster. Unlike the Supermarine Spitfire with its more complicated monocoque design that would have to be returned to the depot to be repaired. The Hurricane was reported by its pilots as being easy to fly and very forgiving, and also because of its thicker wing, a very stable gun platform in a dogfight. Unfortunately, the Hurricane had a few fatal flaws as well. One of them being that the aircraft couldn't get as high as the German 109s it was supposed to be dogfighting, and the second, that it was very prone to catching fire. Although it wasn't as fast as the BF 109, the Hurricane could outturn it in a dogfight. The Germans quickly found the shortfalls of the Hurricane and turned their own tactics to take advantage of its weaknesses. For example, the 109s would fly above the Hurricanes by a few thousand feet where they couldn't climb up to and they would simply drop down and pick off an aircraft at the rear of the formation before climbing back up to their altitude, knowing that the Hurricanes couldn't chase them. Even with the decks slightly stacked against them though, the Hurricane accounted for 60% of all kills during the Battle of Britain. 
and although it was quickly withdrawn from frontline service after the battle, the Hurricane would go on to serve for the remainder of the war in secondary theaters and as a ground attack aircraft. The Mark II Hurricane was developed to address some of the issues that had been noted during the Battle of Britain, one of the biggest being a two-stage supercharger added to the engine, along with the installation of 20mm cannons to improve its firepower. Unfortunately, when you add more weight to an aircraft, that sort of nulls the extra power it now has. Although the Hurricane could no longer keep up with the latest German fighters, by 1941, it had found two new roles as a night fighter and an intruder aircraft, where dogfighting really isn't a big deal. The Hurricane would sneak over to enemy territory at night and catch aircraft while they're coming in to land and their pilots were thinking about sleep and snaps. The Hurricane also found itself in colder weather in 1941 as the Soviets quickly found themselves needing modern fighters to take on the Germans. When China decided to cancel its order for Canadian Hurricanes and go American, the Canadians were then able to provide over 300 Hurricanes for Soviet use. In desperate need of a modern fighter as well, the Hurricane found itself flying off of the decks of Royal Navy aircraft carriers. Again, the Hurricane's sturdy design made it well suited for carrier use, its rugged design enabling it to stand up well to carrier operations. During the darkest period of the Battle of the Atlantic, the Hawker Hurricane also found itself fulfilling a unique role as a convoy escort. Because the German Focke-Wulf Condor and bombers were able to track convoys out over the Atlantic beyond fighter range, convoys would also fall victim to U-boats that were honed in by the bombers. So what would happen is the Royal Navy took some sea hurricanes and put them on board merchant ships and used a catapult to launch the aircraft whenever enemy bombers were spotted. Unfortunately for the pilots, this was often a one-way trip as once they were shot off the ship, there was nowhere for them to land. Only being launched eight times in combat, seven of the hurricane pilots had to bail out after their fuel was exhausted and wait to be picked up by another vessel in the convoy. One of the eight pilots was able to fly off to Russia and land at a Soviet airfield. This role of the hurricane definitely speaks to the courage of its pilots, who would take off knowing that there was a very likely possibility they would die in the cold Atlantic before they would be picked up and rescued. Moving back into the build of the Arma Hurricane, I took some lead wire and decided to add the hydraulic plumbing that was next to the pilot's leg. I also ran some lead wire to simulate control cables for other components of the fighter. Before starting any of this extra work, I was sure to test fit everything in the cockpit and make sure I had room to do this. It would have been a huge embarrassment to do all this work before test fitting, only to find out that nothing would go together afterward. But like I said earlier, when a kit goes together this well, it leaves you a lot of energy to be creative and do some more work with the kit than you normally may. With the detail painting complete, I then created my own wash using Starship Filth oils from Abtalung and then thinned it out with some AK enamel thinner. And once this concoction sticks slightly to the side of my paint tray, it's then ready to go onto the model. This was done without any type of clear coat going down to protect the paint. Because I'm using a lacquer paint, the enamel wash does not react with the paint, making it very easy to apply and to clean up excess. Once the wash had dried and been cleaned up, it was then time to assemble the remaining cockpit components and close up the fuselage. The assembly of the cockpit was hassle-free, and the only thing to watch out for is to make sure the bulkhead behind the seat slides over the fuselage halves and doesn't try to go under it. You can see here how that bulkhead is sitting in front of the fuselage. Arma's engineering shows well here as there's no putty required for the wing to fuselage gap. One thing to note with the Hurricane is that the little area in front of the horizontal stabilizers does not get blended into the canvas. That's a metal part on the actual aircraft and there's a noticeable step here. So Arma's actually captured this very well. When installing the lower part of the fuselage, it drops into place with no filling required. This design leads me to believe that we'll see a sea hurricane down the road. And if that happens, I will be very excited. In hindsight, when building this kit, the only areas I had to clean up were the front of the wings where the two halves come together and the fuselage halves at the top where those come together. But any model's gonna have that. 
Once I was done blending the seams together, I then came in with my JLC razor saw and rivet wheel to restore the lost detail. This process can take a few cycles, so don't be upset if it takes you two or three attempts to get a seam fully repaired. A quick check with some black paint will let you know if the repairs are complete. Because the sample kit that Armid sent me was one of the pre-orders, I was very fortunate to also have some 3D printed cannons, seats, and exhaust pipes for the Hurricane. To make painting of the landing gear easier, I dry fitted all the pieces in place before gluing the braces to the main strut. Then after it dried, I was able to remove it for paint. The only problem I could find with this kit while building it was that there was a short shot on the part of the upper wing on the right side. So I used some two-part epoxy, rolled a tiny little ball, and then stuffed it into the hole where the top of the wing should have been. I used a wet silicone brush to shape it into place, and then once it's dried, I had sanded it flush. Once the epoxy had had a full 24 hours to dry, I then re-scribed the panel line. While the epoxy was hardening, I also decided to install some brake lines on the landing gear doors of the Hurricane. I used two different sizes of lead wire, and then a piece of brass tubing to simulate where the union is, or the fitting, to connect the hose to the hard line. One trick to working with lead wire is to glue one end in place and let that take a few minutes to dry before you start to bend it and secure it. Otherwise, there is a chance it might pop out on you. With assembly of the kit now complete, it was time to start paint. And for a primer, I used Mr. Surfacer 1500 Black. This lets me catch any last minute imperfections and set a really nice base for doing the sandwich shading. One other part to be aware of when assembling this kit is that the clear parts on the wings don't 100% fit and I had to run a sanding stick down the side just two times. Once the lenses were on though, I put down some Mr. Silver 8 again and then followed it with two thin layers of chipping fluid from AK. I like to shoot my chipping fluid on from a little bit of a distance, that way it looks like there's dust going onto the paint. If you start to get water beads, you have too much chipping fluid on there and you're going to have to wipe it off and start again. As always, I like my models to be slightly beat up with some wear and tear and to look like they're actually seeing some combat. So it's time to do some trusted sandwich shading. And this is just a case of taking different colors like grays, white, khakis, and lightly blending them in onto the black paint and then coming in with a final blend layer. And the great thing about this style painting is if you're not happy at the end of it, you can keep adding paints until you are happy. If you're not a fan of using oil paints or you want to save some time, this is a great way to add some layering and depth to your paint. The more drastic the difference in colors, the more effective it is at making your final paints look very worn and blown out. Although this may look very drastic in the beginning before you put down your decals and washes, it's important to remember that as you bring in more layers, like your pin washes, your oils, and flat coats, this effect is going to be pushed back on the model and won't be as drastic as it is right now. To make the camouflage masks for this model, I photocopied the paint page from the instructions and then resized it to a one-to-one -one scale and cut it out. I then used some tape folded in half just to hold the mask up a little bit off the model and that gives me a nice soft edge. There's just something very relaxing and zen-like when it comes to removing masks from the model, especially when everything works out. It's not very zen-like when it didn't work and you have to come back in and fix things. Because I had chipping fluid down on the model before the paint, I had to be very careful and detack the tape as much as possible before laying it on top of the paint. Otherwise, I would run the risk of tearing the paint up as I removed the tape. For the radiator under the aircraft, I first painted it rubber black and then decided to do some dry brushing. Now dry brushing is a technique where you put a little bit of paint on the brush and then try to unload as much as possible. When it doesn't look like the brush is leaving any paint on your finger, then it's the perfect time to use it. With painting pretty much finished on the aircraft, it was now time to move on to the detail painting and weathering. And the first step to doing any chipping on paint, I like to use a toothpick and just knock some small chips into the paint. Once I've done that, I'll then apply a little bit of water on top of the paint 
and then use a stiff brush to start chipping away at areas that I want there to be some wear and tear. One big concern I had for this model was how the decals were going to go down over all the raised detail. I've had some issues in the past with some models and decals that the decals would not seat fully down, but by using some Mr. Mark setter, and then using some Tamiya super strong setting solution, these decals had no problems going down over the details. It just took two or three rounds of Tamiya super strong to get those to fully sit down. So be patient and you'll have no problems with these decals. Once all the decals were down, it was time to lock everything in place with a flat coat. And these decals performed very nicely and they look like they're painted on. For the panel line wash, I brought back out the oil paints and added some thinner until I was happy with the consistency of the wash. And then using a long, fine tip brush, I slowly applied this in place. But then a challenge came up that I wasn't expecting. With all these raised details, how was I going to clean up the wash to make it look neater? And the problem was solved pretty quickly by using some sponge out of an accessory kit. By moistening this sponge with some thinner, I slowly dabbed it onto all the raised areas until the wash started to blend in place. Now this doesn't look as crisp and as neat as when it goes into a recessed area, but it did work out pretty well. I still wasn't completely happy with the chipping on the wings, so I came in with the brush and then added some small chips using acrylic paint, and I was pretty happy with how this went. If I had too much chipping, the nice thing about acrylic paint on the lacquer is I could simply wipe it away and start again. After finding some great references of exhaust on a restored hurricane, I used some light rust acrylic paint and some washes to get a nice dark tone. The nice thing about using a thin oil wash is that you can slowly build it up until you're happy with the tones. Just remember, not all exhaust pipes on aircraft are made from the same material, so it's worthwhile to take a few minutes researching to find out what you're going to need to do. To get ready to do some oil paint rendering for the exhaust stains, I put some oil paints down on some cardboard to slowly wick out the lint seed. Then it was time to decide how to do this touch-up paint on the right of the aircraft. And this is the only reference photo I have, but there's definitely something there. Because you can see a little bit of the old squadron code on the side of the aircraft, I believe what happened here is the ground crew simply painted over some old nose art they didn't like on the side of the aircraft. And because this was done in the field, it wasn't neat and tidy. After a few hours of sitting on the cardboard, most of the lint seeds have been removed from the oils and they're ready for use. What I'm looking for is a blend of enamel thinner that's a little bit thicker than a wash, but not the full opacity of the oil paint. And then I slowly add these up on the side of the aircraft, adding some oil, blending it, then adding some more oil, blending it some more, and then when I'm happy, I take a hair dryer and quickly heat up the oil to dry it. And then I can come in with another layer, or different colors if I want to. Stippling brushes are great for blending things in, in an uneven, dirty manner. Once I was happy with the Starship filth, I then came in with some light mud and added that color into the exhaust as well, and that really makes it look more vibrant and dynamic. Then to get the effect of the crew trying to wipe this off, or brushing up against the aircraft, I use this weird stringy brush in a vertical motion to stripe out the exhaust stain. And that's going to bring this build to a close. I would just like to take a minute to thank Arma Hobbies for sending me this Hurricane to build. It's a fantastic kit. You should definitely pick one up. You won't be disappointed. And I would like to thank you, the viewers, for taking the time to watch. As always, make sure you click like and subscribe if you haven't to the channel, and leave a comment below. This is The Model Guy, and I will see you next time.